Coronavirus pandemic. The White House responds to the recent rise in cases, what they want you to know. Immigration crisis. Republican lawmakers reveal more video of their trip to the southern border. We have analysis. Palm Sunday blast. See the fallout from the terror attack at a Catholic cathedral in Indonesia. And Holy Week message. Why Pope Francis calls on Catholics throughout the world to imitate Mary. On EWTN News Nightly for Monday, March 29th, 2021. Good evening and thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Eric Rosales in for Tracy Sable. Well, President Joe Biden updates the nation on the battle against the coronavirus pandemic. Now it comes as new cases are rising, which is worrying White House COVID-19 response team. And by the way, they are not yet calling it another surge. White House president or White House correspondent Owen Jensen reports. Owen. Eric, Easter Sunday is less than a week away. Christians are marking the holiest week of the year. There is hope that the pandemic will end soon, but today the president warned that the nation is in a life and death race with the virus. President Joe Biden goes before the cameras. We could still see a setback in the vaccination program. And most importantly, if we let our guard down now, we could see a virus getting worse, not better. The White House says 36% of U.S. adults have received at least one dose of a vaccine, and close to one in five adults are fully vaccinated. I'm reiterating my call for every governor, mayor, and local leader to maintain and reinstate the mask mandate. Please, this is not politics. But daily new cases are up 10%. Hospitalizations have increased, and deaths are up nearly 3%, hovering around 1,000 a day. I'm going to pause here. I'm going to lose the script. Dr. Rochelle Walensky of the COVID-19 response team laid it on the line, urging Americans not to give up now, get vaccinated. She's worried about the current trajectory of the pandemic in the U.S. And I'm going to reflect on the recurring feeling I have of impending doom. We have so much to look forward to, so much promise and potential of where we are, and so much reason for hope. But right now, I'm scared. At this afternoon's White House press briefing. The president has not held back in calling for uh, governors, leaders, uh, the American people to continue to abide by the public health guidelines. Meanwhile, longer protection for renters living on the edge. The White House extends a federal moratorium on evictions through June. The president is committed to supporting renters and small landlords through the COVID-19 crisis. The president also said today that by April 19th, just three weeks from now, there will be a vaccination site within five miles of where most Americans live. The president also warned that the war is still far from won. At the White House, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. Thank you so much, Owen. Well, this past weekend, 18 Republican senators wrapped up their journey to the U.S. southern border. On his Twitter account, Texas Senator Ted Cruz shared an encounter. He says it highlights what he is calling a lack of transparency from the Biden administration. You were instructed you. when 18 I senators ask you came to down here. respect the people, give them dignity and respect. I respect them, and I want to fix this situation. We all want and to fix the administration this, you're working for is responsible anymore. for these conditions. Please respect the people with dignity okay. and respect. And sir. I ask you to respect the, the people as well. This I am is respecting not you. Respect. I well, besides crowded conditions, the senators say that they observed illegal boarding crossings and sometimes heard taunts across the river from drug cartels. Well, joining us now is Vince Colonnais, editorial director of The Daily Caller. Vince, thank you so much for joining us. Now, thank over you. the weekend, The Daily Caller had reporters down at the U.S.-Mexico border. What exactly did they find? They found every hour hundreds of migrants crossing the border, many of them from Central America, and as they crossed, they went straight to Border Patrol. Uh, their goal was to turn themselves in and to begin the process of immigrating in the United States. The effect is, of course, that there's a lot of the people who arrived uh, identified as being children, as being of age, to be able to make an asylum claim, and that begins the government process of processing them inside of these detention centers we've got very little look into. 
uh, what little look we've had, we've gotten courtesy of senators like Ted Cruz and Democrat Congressman Henry Cuellar. Uh, and then eventually those kids will be uh, allowed into the United States. Uh, it's a process that has overwhelmed the Biden administration. And our reporters at The Daily Caller spent several days on the border with the Border Patrol watching very closely as wave after wave of migrants came across the southern border. And we're hearing that many of these people are being released, uh, just in fact, even some without court dates. And what do you think about these senators going down to the border? Is it a publicity stunt, or would you say that it's effective? I would say it's an effective use of politics. The point of politics is that we decide who runs the country and whose policies we prefer. And Republicans, while they're in the minority in the Senate and the House right now, and they don't have the White House, the one thing they can do is, at least in this issue, is demonstrate some transparency about what our government's doing. So they're using their access to those facilities to bring that story to the American public and ultimately to convince voters to choose Republicans by the midterms uh, now, a little less than two years away. So, um, yeah, I mean, in terms of a political tactic, effective in terms of transparency for the public, it was a big win as well. It was important to be able to see what's going on inside those facilities. Yeah, most definitely. I mean, well, do you think that this is going to have any effect on how the Biden administration is handling the situation down there at the border? Uh, you know, the Biden administration has done everything it can to minimize this as a crisis. In fact, uh, the, although President Trump, uh, President Biden rather, has put Vice President Kamala Harris in charge of the border crisis, she indicated yet again today she has no intention of actually visiting the border and seeing the crisis that she's supposed to be managing. Uh, the administration is routinely not referred to this as a crisis, but instead as merely a challenge. But internal documents that both uh, the Wall Street Journal and Axios reported on over the weekend indicate that the Biden administration, while they're publicly saying that this is totally normal, there's nothing unusual about the surge on the border, that they're planning on record numbers to cross our border every month through September of this year. Uh, really big numbers. The Biden administration knows they're on the way. Uh, but as far as the public facing side of it, they're acting like there's nothing to see here. But no doubt she should head on down to the border, should she not? Absolutely. If you want to get your arms around the crisis that you're supposed to be trying to fix, you need to be at the border. And over the weekend, uh, let's switch gears now. Over the weekend, the state of Georgia passed voting reform and that would restore voter confidence, they say, in the election process. You know, Democrats disagree with the Republican governor, but what do you think about the measure there in Georgia? Well, there have been some vile attacks on this law, so vile that it makes you think, like, goodness, is it possible that anybody could support it? Last week, the president of the United States uh, invented an analogy during his press conference, said that this makes Jim Crow look like Jim Eagle, uh, suggesting some sort of uh, uh, very racist bill going on in Georgia. The truth is, if you actually take a look at the legislation, it expands early voting in Georgia. It makes permanent things like drop boxes for absentee ballots. It codifies and makes permanent ab uh, no excuse absentee voting. And it has a regular audit of um, election lines to make sure that no line lasts longer than an hour at any polling place. And if it does, that in future elections, those lines are, are made smaller and smaller by giving people more access to more polls. The reality of what's in the legislation is shockingly different, in fact, than what we see in the media. There was a lot of attention placed on the idea that people won't be able to get water handed to them in right. these lines. That's the way it's right. been construed in the press. The truth is that uh, the, the law goes out of its way to say that well, they don't want people giving food and drinks as a form of bribery to encourage people to vote for the candidate of their preference. Right. And if anybody needs water, that election officials have to make it available to them at the polling sites. Well, Vince, we can talk about this all day, but thank you so much for joining us. Vince Colonnese, editorial director of The Daily Caller. Thank you so much, Vince. My pleasure. Thanks. Well, the former Minneapolis police officer charged with killing George Floyd went on trial today by showing video of Floyd's arrest last May. The prosecutor said that former officer Derek Chauvin betrayed his badge during the several minutes Floyd was gasping for air. The defense attorney said Floyd resisted arrest, had evidence of drugs in his system, and that Chauvin was acting accordingly to training. The president of Indonesia is denouncing a bomb attack yesterday at a Catholic cathedral that wounded nearly two dozen people.
President Joko Widodo said, quote, I strongly condemn this act of terrorism. He also called for a full investigation. The blast wounded at least 20 people. Just as mass ended, it killed the, sus the two suspected bombers. EWTN News Rome correspondent Colm Flynn joins us now. Colm, what did Pope Francis ask Catholics around the world to pray for during this Holy Week? Good evening, Eric. Well, yesterday after Palm Sunday Mass and just before the Angelus, Pope Francis asked people to pray for the victims of an attack which happened outside a Catholic church in Indonesia yesterday morning. In what is suspected to be a suicide bombing, a young couple detonated a pressure cooker bomb outside a cathedral in the city of Massacre during Palm Sunday Mass. Now, the bomb was detonated just as security guards confronted the couple. 20 people were wounded in the explosion, including four church guards, and there was damage done to the church as well as neighboring buildings. The Associated Press are reporting that Indonesian police say suspect that a newly married couple were behind the attack. It is believed that they are in their mid-20s and were members of a group which has pledged allegiance to the Islamic State. And Pope Francis also celebrated Palm Sunday Mass in the Basilica. What was it like this year due to COVID? Well, Eric, for the second year in a row, Pope Francis led the celebration of Palm Sunday inside a much quieter St. Peter's Basilica with a limited number in the congregation, of course, due to COVID-19. Now, during his homily, the Pope spoke about the sense of amazement during Holy Week, the amazement and joy as Jesus enters Jerusalem and the amazement and sorrow when he is condemned to death and crucified. Pope Francis asked us never to lose that sense of amazement. And he warned that a faith that no longer feels that a sense of amazement could grow dull. He emphasized the point, let us be amazed by Jesus so that we can start to live again. Amen to that. And Colm, uh, you mentioned COVID-19 there, and I believe that on Saturday there was also a special anniversary at the Vatican. What was that? That's right, Eric. Saturday, March the 27th, marked the one-year anniversary of Pope Francis's extraordinary Urbi et Orbi blessing, which he gave standing in an empty St. Peter's Square exactly one year ago, when the coronavirus pandemic really began to sweep across the world. And you may remember those very haunting images of the Pope walking up the steps in front of St. Peter's Basilica in the dark and in the rain, where he then offered a blessing to the millions watching live on television across the globe. Well, to mark the one-year anniversary, the Vatican Dicastery for Communication, they released a new book entitled, Why Are You Afraid? Have You No Faith? It's been released in several different languages and consists of texts and photographs related to the Pope's blessing. Eric? Well, you stay safe out there. Colin Flynn, EWTN News, Rome correspondent. Thank you, Colin. Thank you, Eric. And Pope Francis reminds the faithful to imitate the Blessed Vir Virgin Mary this Holy Week. Palme e la croce stanno insieme. At his Sunday address at the Vatican, the Holy Father said that the faithful should follow the daily way of the cross. Pope Francis also reminded the faithful to follow the Blessed Virgin Mary, who became her son's first follower and never left his side. Rome was not the only city to have Palm Sunday Mass yesterday. In Jerusalem, the faithful gathered at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. <laughs> Clergy and faithful gathered around the church, built on the site where the body of Jesus was laid to de his death, and then he rose again from the dead. The annual Holy Week events commemorating the burial and resurrection, it usually attracts tens of thousands of pilgrims from around the world, but this year, celebrations were restricted because of the pandemic. More than 25 million people in Manila are officially on lockdown. Government officials have banned religious services and even leisure travel, travel that is, because of the coronavirus cases. Some of the faithful gathered yesterday outside the churches to celebrate Palm Sunday. The Philippines is roughly 80 percent Catholic. And coming up a little bit later in the newscast, analysis of Holy Week and what it means for the faithful from Thomas, from Father Thomas Petrie from the Dominican House of Studies right here in Washington, D.C. Coming up, South Dakota seeks to protect unborn babies diagnosed with Down syndrome. Welcome back. 
Unborn babies diagnosed with Down syndrome have a right to life. That's the message being sent today by South Dakota Governor Kristi Noem and pro-life leader Marjorie Dannenfelser. They say that all children deserve love and protection, but research indicates nearly two-thirds of unborn babies diagnosed with Down syndrome are aborted. Susan B. Anthony List, President Marjorie Dannenfelser, joins us now via Skype. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm so happy to be with you. Thanks. Yeah. What's your message to expected parents out there who learn that their baby may have Down syndrome? Oh, you have some beautiful new paths to persevere in and uh, such a delight and a bright light at the center of your families and in your communities. I. I think that what happened today in um, in South Dakota, where I actually am, I'm in the um, I'm in the state capital. I'm uh, Christy Nome, the governor. Now we're together earlier, but a there was a great fire um, not far away, and she had to go away. There's 300 homes being evacuated, mm. but we had a beautiful gathering in her office. Um, there were um, just uh, great celebrations about the beauty of this bill, and uh, and the fact that we would protect the most vulnerable among the most vulnerable in our nation living up to our founding promises uh, is a great inspiration and the 10th state that has done that in these United States. And there's so much support out there. What do you hear from parents who already welcome a Down syndrome child into their family? Well, I happen to live among uh, many families with Down syndrome children because I have a special needs child myself. And I hear constantly among those families and then also uh, some of the top lobbyists in the country are Down syndrome uh, young adults. And what I hear is their lives are happy. That's what they self-report yeah. over and over again. And even in polls, 90% say they have happy, uh, happy lives. And they may, and by extension, they um, raise their families to a whole nother place of joy that would be impossible without them. I think that if you've experienced um, the life and friendship of a Down syndrome person, you know that there's a special light, a special avenue to God, a special spirituality and hope at the center of all conversations. Um, they're just some of the best people that I've known. You know, we're all disabled in some way. Some yes. of us uh, could really use a little bit of a burst of what Down syndrome children have. And the best way to do that is to welcome them into the world made perfectly as their Lord created them and lift them up as the teachers that they are to the rest of us. Uh, it, and that I is mean, a blessing that we, I, I've really had and many of us have. And when we share those stories, we all basically say the same thing, just joy. And we can learn so much from them. I mean, it's like, and are, are you hearing any other states considering similar legislation? Yes, this is really taken off. Ten states have passed this. Two have still are, have been allowed to allow that bill go into effect in Louisiana and North Dakota. Um, all the other states have been enjoined. It's possible that the one here will be enjoined in the court won't allow it to go into effect, which is what they sort of expect. But that means that this governor will have standing in a case in Arkansas, which they hope very much will make it to the Supreme Court, along with some of the other uh, laws that have been passed that are similar. When we see a circuit split on this, we, um, after all this legislation, all this activity that's been going on all over the country, we already know that the Supreme Court is interested in hearing this because of the words of Supreme Court Justice, Justice Thomas. He said that well, they want to see more of this legislation um, and that they and that he considers this a case of first impression, which basically means this never has been considered. This issues and the issues involved in this discrimination abortion case um, have not been heard and that it's time the Supreme Court did. Most many states are also include other types of discriminatory abortions in terms of ethnicity and gender. Uh, so that means that uh, something really beautiful is heading towards the court could very well be an erosion or overturn of row ahead of us because of the beautiful light of these children that we want to welcome into the world. Well, I tell you, that is very promising news. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Susan B. Anthony List, President Marjorie Dannenfelser. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Up next, a closer look at Holy Week, what you might not know about Lent, Good Friday, and Easter. As we know, yesterday was Palm Sunday. It's also the start of Holy Week, and our next guest will give us a preview of what to expect during the most important week of the church calendar.
Joining us now to discuss Holy Week is Father Thomas Petrie with the Dominican House of Studies. Father Petrie, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Eric. It's good to be here with you. So, Father, why does the date of Easter change, especially Christmas falls on the same day of the year and most of the saints' feast days as well? Well, as with everything in the church, this has historical precedent. We've always celebrated Christmas on December 25th. And with the saints, we always celebrate their feast day on the day, usually the day they die and enter into eternity. But with, with Easter, uh, there's a historical controversies about why we celebrate Easter when we do. And the Western church is very different from the Eastern church on this point. The Western church often has Easter earlier because we celebrate Easter according to the Gregorian calendar hmm. on on the first Sunday after the first full moon, after uh, the vernal equinox, after spring starts. So that's why Easter is when it is and why it changes, because the first full moon often is um, at different times after the start of spring. And when exactly does Lent end then? Lent, this is an interesting thing. Uh, Lent, according to the church's norms on the liturgical year, Lent actually ends with the Mass of the Lord's Supper on Holy Thursday. Now, that mm. doesn't necessarily mean you can go ahead and have what you want from Lent. You can continue to give up your sweets until Easter Sunday, but the Mass of the Lord's Supper on Holy Thursday is the end of Lent because you're beginning a whole new sort of mini-season, if you will, which is the Triduum. Well, I tell you what, Father, you know me well giving up the sweets, yes. Uh, well, we often hear about Holy Thursday and Good Friday and Easter services called the Triduum. What does that mean exactly, and uh, what's the history behind it? Well, the Triduum, the very word means in a period of three days in Latin or over the course of three days. And what we're talking about is the one period between Holy Thursday to Easter Sunday morning, which is basically three days. And it's the three days the church has always celebrated not only the resurrection of Christ, but the whole movement from the Mass of the Lord's Supper, from his last supper with the disciples, through his passion, to being dead in the tomb on Holy Saturday, to the resurrection on Easter Sunday. It's one grand movement, one beautiful celebration with ups and downs, just like the disciples would have experienced uh, 2,000 years ago. And what are uh, some of the most important parts or even some of your favorite parts of the service for this week? Well, I think Holy Thursday, uh, rem remembering that this is the day when the Eucharist and the priesthood was instituted in the church. I love the veneration of the cross on Good Friday, that instrument which caused and brought our salvation. And I really, especially, my favorite part of the Triduum, of course, is the Easter Vigil on Holy Saturday. This is the Vigil of Vigils. It's sort of the Super Bowl of the liturgical year, a grand fire, a procession in candlelight, eight readings, the exalted in which the deacon proclaims the resurrection of Christ. It's usually a two, two and a half hour, sometimes three hour mass in which we stay up late to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. And Father, as we know, we're still battling COVID out there. Any advice for the faithful out there when they do attend church? Well, always just to be safe, uh, to practice safe distancing, and uh, to be thankful that we can attend uh, the Easter services uh, this year, the Triduum services. We Many weren't able to do that last year, so I'm hoping this Triduum is a time to give thanks not only for the Lord's uh, salvation, His suffering, death, and resurrection, but for the end, the continuing ending of this pandemic. Well, Father, thank you so much for joining us again. Father Petrie with the Dominican House of Studies. Thank you, Father. Thank you. And finally, tonight, Saturday, marked the fifth anniversary of the death of Mother Angelica. One cardinal remembered her at a mass in her honor inside St. Peter's Basilica. The truth is Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. These words were always clear in Mother Angelica's mind and the heart. Cardinal Fernando Filoni also hailed Mother Angelica's extraordinary creativity, and he thanked the foundress of EWTN for her work spreading the gospel. He added Mother Angelica, quote, I'm sure is happy. We want to thank you for watching tonight. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Eric Rosales. Have yourself a wonderful night, and God bless.